A message from Moody about the 7th of July 2005. Dear viewer, I hope this finds you well, in good spirit and having a good day. Regarding the 7-7-2005 terrorist attacks in London, let us look at the facts and see what we were told and compare them. Then, using Occam's razor and common sense, let us see what conclusions are to be drawn so we can all understand what most likely really did happen that day. First chapter, title, Mock Exercises and Bomb Hoaxes in the Run-Up to 7-7-2005 More than a year before the 7-7-2005 attacks, on the 16th of May 2004, an edition of the BBC One Panorama programme broadcasted a mock exercise imagining what would happen if a terrorist attack was executed in London in the near future consisting of three explosions on tube trains in the London Underground and one explosion on a road vehicle. The following excerpt from the BBC programme gives us a good idea of why this program was made. If there are now bombs going off uh, above ground, uh, in this case uh, a, a lorry being attacked, it could happen anywhere. So the uh, potential for mass panic across not just the capital but the whole country is very much with us. Um, I think therefore we need to look at more uh, serious measures. We do have reserve powers in effect to take over the BBC if we were to wish to and to get them to broadcast whatever we wanted them to broadcast. Those powers are there in the Broadcasting Act. My advice to the Prime Minister would be not to use those, but I think we should be talking to the uh, broadcasters about having the Prime Minister on the air very quickly. You wouldn't disagree with that, Michael, at all? No, I entirely agree that uh, the Prime Minister should be out there. Uh, and we shouldn't be using the powers to bring in the BBC, but we should certainly be talking to the broadcasters about the way in which the coverage is going to be organised. Please note well that he said the coverage is going to be organised. In other words, he was saying that they would write the script for and then edit and control the media coverage of an event in which there were three explosions on London tube trains and one on a road vehicle if such an event were to take place in the near future. The question that begs to be asked is this. Was that what they were actually in the process of planning and precisely the reason for that program? This is the kind of terrorist attack the government repeatedly says is going to happen. We've been absolutely clear we can't guarantee that there will never be an attack. It's quite likely that they're planning one now. I am wondering about the purpose and effect of this very program. This BBC Panorama program appears to have been used by those behind the 7-7-2005 attack as the means by which the media's response to the attack in the near future was studied so it could be controlled and directed towards their own ends. Mr Price plays the bad cop and issues the threat of taking over control of the BBC and then Mr Portillo plays the good cop and says that there is no need to do that as long as the BBC behaves itself and broadcasts whatever they want them to. The good cop, bad cop scenario is just theatre, to deceive the viewer. The reality is that the BBC is a government propaganda machine and is already, and always has been, controlled and used by the government. The headlines at nine o'clock. In the past hour, there have been three major explosions on the London Underground. The first occurred at ten past eight on the Piccadilly line between Knightsbridge and Hyde Park Corner. The second at 16 minutes past eight on the central line between Tottenham Court Road and Oxford Circus. And the third at 27 minutes past eight as a train was arriving at Vauxhall Station from Stockwell on the Victoria Line. 
Emergency services have been called to all three scenes. There are no reports available yet on the number of casualties, and the police have said that it's too early to identify a possible cause. London Underground is now closed, and the police are asking people not to travel. 350,000 people alone are making their way towards the city of London at this point. And if the access overload system has been triggered and they can't get onto the mobile telephones, this will have pr profound indications for them, the next of kin. We can now confirm that a tanker carrying chlorine has exploded at the junction of Shoreditch High Street and Commercial Street. Chlorine is extremely toxic in this form and the police are issuing express warnings to people to stay indoors, close windows and remain there until the all clear is given. In the days leading up to 7-7-2005, there were hoax bomb scares in Nottingham and Sheffield. Were these false alarm hoaxes meant not only to cause panic and confusion, but also to lull everyone into a false sense of security, and into thinking that the initial reports in London on 7-7-2005 would also be false alarm hoaxes, so people would ignore them until it was too late? Second chapter title Peter Power Dupe or Accomplice Then, on 7 7 2005, we were told on TV by Peter Power of Visor Consultants that they and the private company employing them, who helped choose the scenario for it, were running a mock terrorist drill in the London Underground with practically the same scenario as what actually really happened on that day. In other words, the actual mock anti-terror drill that the BBC Panorama programme of May 2004 had outlined had been chosen by Visor's client to be carried out on the very same day that four Muslim suicide bombers also chose the same scenarios that Visor's client had chosen for the mock drill causing real and devastating explosions on three London tube trains and one road vehicle. Please think about that unbelievable set of coincidences for a few seconds, to let the implications of it sink in. Then, please ask yourself, what are the odds against all of that happening by chance? Just to get this right, you were actually working today on an exercise that envisioned yes. virtually this scenario. Uh, almost precisely. I was up until 2 o'clock this morning because it, it's our job, my own company, Visor Consultants. We specialise in helping people to get their crisis management response. How do you jump from slow time thinking to quick time doing? And we chose a scenario with their assistance which is based on a terrorist attack because they're very close to uh, a property occupied by Jewish businessmen. They're in the city and there are more American banks in the city than there are in the whole of New York. A logical thing to do. And it, I've still so got how, the... I was I've going got to say, how extraordinary today <laughs> must feel for you as, as it unfolds. In his TV video clip, Peter Power states that their customer helped to choose the exact scenario. I repeat... Visor's customer helped to choose the exact scenario. To this day, Peter Power refuses to publicly identify the customer who chose the exact scenario. Why? Third chapter title Foreign Security Firms Can They Be Trusted? Verint Systems is the security firm that is responsible for the CCTV surveillance cameras in the London Underground Rail Network, and it is an Israeli company with approximately a thousand employees. No CCTV footage of the four Muslims boarding the tube trains has been released by Verint, who claim that their cameras were not working. Why? because the four Muslims were not on the tube trains that blew up. Fourth chapter title The Four Muslims, Actors or Patsies We were also told that the training exercise involved a thousand people and, of course, amongst those one thousand people would have to be the four people 
who were recruited to play the parts of the mock terrorists. Therefore, as part of the exercise, they would have recruited four young Muslim men to carry four backpacks that were to contain mock explosive devices, who were their Muslim recruits. These Muslim men would naturally buy return train tickets and not one-way tickets because they would be going home after playing their parts in the training exercise. One of them, the oldest, who would be considered the ringleader of the group because of his age, would have been asked to make a suicide video prior to 7-7-2005, being told it would form part of the training mock terrorist exercise in order to make the exercise and possibly a film to be made of it look as realistic as possible. He would obviously not have been told the details of the whole plan until later, probably when he and the others arrived at Luton on the 7th of July 2005, to make absolutely certain that the scenario of the drill which would take place that day could not be talked about by or to anyone. The second oldest would also be asked to make a similar video as a backup for just in case anything went wrong and or the oldest pulled out of the drill before the 7th of July 2005. It should be noted that neither Mohammed Siddiqui Khan nor Shehzad Tanweer specify what their targets were in their videos. It is also interesting to note that no one has ever claimed responsibility for the 7-7-2005 bombings except for a message on a fake Al-Qaeda website on the same day that was traced to Texas in the USA. Two years afterwards, because more and more people doubt the official story and are proving it to be lies and deception, and are rightfully demanding an independent investigation, the police have arrested, frightened, intimidated and harassed Mohammed Siddiqui Khan's widow into publicly condemning her husband. She has a young daughter to protect and has stated that she is now afraid of the police. They kept her in custody for six days to intimidate her and then showed her what they claim is her husband's will and suicide note. Obviously this was done to get her to condemn her husband publicly in exchange for the authorities implied agreement to leave her alone to which she will have agreed in order to protect herself and her young daughter from further harassment. Where were these documents found and why did it take two years for them to be shown to her? They are, after all, her rightful property, if genuine. Two years is ample time to forge a short handwritten note and signature on a will. In view of the amount of time this suicide note has taken to be mentioned, the timing of it, and all the lies and evidence the authorities have told, fabricated and planted, it cannot be trusted and must be considered another forgery, along with any other new so-called evidence that they might come up with. So the scene is set for the training exercise to go ahead. The fake terrorists have been recruited, the suicide videos have been made, and everyone has been given basic instructions for the day that the exercise is to be put into operation, 7-7-2005. The four mock terrorist actors were to meet at Luton train station at 07.20 a.m. on the 7th of July 2005 and catch the 07.40 a.m. train from Luton to King's Cross Thameslink station with their pretend bomb backpacks and then split up and catch three tube trains and one bus to prearranged destinations where the fake explosions were to take place as part of the training exercise. Finally the big day arrived. Everyone was ready. Everyone was either already where he was meant to be or was heading there. But first let us take a step backwards for a moment to look at the bigger picture 
and put this mock terror exercise into context with what was happening in Britain at that time. Tony Blair was in big trouble because he had just been sent a very clear message from the British nation via the May 2005 general election in which he was almost voted out of power that the British people did not want British troops fighting in George Bush's war of terror in the Middle East. So, to be able to keep the British troops fighting in the Middle East, Tony Blair desperately needed something to happen to change the nation's mind. Glen Eagles Tony Blair, George Bush, G8 meeting, agenda of addressing world poverty, forced on them by Live 8 concerts around the world, but not for long. Their lucrative, evil, phony and very unpopular war on terror, which is really a war of terror, will promptly return to the top of the agenda with four big bangs. No time for the poor, the rich have lots more money to make and people to murder. Leeds, where three of the Muslim actors lived and were recruited, and where the oldest, Mohammed Siddiqui Khan, was befriended by the local police and was regularly called upon by them to help them to sort out gang rivalry problems. Mohammed was also taken on a tour of the House of Commons by a Leeds MP who befriended him. The perfect patsy, someone who was made to believe he could trust the authorities and that they would therefore not deceive or harm him. Someone who could in turn recruit two other Muslims for the drill so they could all become famous and make a nice bit of clean and easy extra money and show their patriotism by helping the authorities to protect Britain from terrorism. Aylesbury, a fourth Muslim actor who has been recruited, Jermaine Lindsay from Aylesbury, will also meet them in Luton. Luton Transport security firm ICTS, another Israeli company, has an office just a mile away from the Luton train station, which is suspected to be where the Muslim actors received their final instructions before setting off for the train station. The details of which trains to board which carriages to get into, where to sit, and which bus to catch, where to sit on it, and at what time. London Commissioner of Police Ian Blair Rudy Giuliani, Mayor of New York on 9-11 Benjamin Netanyahu, who said 9-11 was good for Israel Peter Power, and all those taking part in the mock terrorism drill are present in central London, in or around London underground locations where the explosions take place, and also Tavistock Square. The four men were supposed to arrive together on time at Luton Station and be caught on CCTV at 07.21.54 a.m. entering the station but three of them are not on the same video frames as Hasib Hussain, so have to be inserted later using computer software. Hence the obviously and very badly doctored official single frame time-stamped photo that we have been shown from the CCTV outside Luton Station. They can't show them moving because it has been faked. That's why they show only one single frame still photo. Why did the authorities have to fake this photo? They would have had to fake it because three of the actors missed the tube trains that they were supposed to catch and which blew up without them being on board. And so there was no video footage from variant systems of them boarding the three tube trains for the authorities to be able to use as false evidence to try to prove to the public that the Muslims were guilty. So they had to doctor and show us the fake photo instead. Remember what Michael Portillo said on the May 2004 
BBC Panorama program. The coverage is going to be organised. So far they are apparently running according to the training exercise plan and on schedule. Fifth chapter title The Ghost Trains Unfortunately for the people who have organised the event, the train that the four Muslim actors are supposed to catch, the 0740am train to King's Cross Thameslink, has been cancelled and the next one too, so they cannot possibly make it in time to catch the tube trains that they were supposed to catch as part of the training exercise. The best laid plans of mice and men often go awry as the hand of God interferes. In spite of official confirmation that the 0740 AM train was cancelled and the next one too, the Home Office report still contains the lie that the non-existent 0740 AM train was the one that the four Muslims caught. The authorities have to keep lying about it in order to continue to try to make the public believe that three of the four Muslim men who boarded a train from Luton to King's Cross arrived in time to catch the three tube trains that blew up. In doing so, the authorities make it perfectly clear that the truth of what happened that day is of no importance to them. It is obvious from their actions that the only thing that is important to the authorities is to make us believe what they had already planned to make us believe, even when the facts prove it to be a lie. The first available train the Muslim actors can catch gets them to King's Cross after the tube trains have already left without them. Hasib Hussein splits off from the other three at King's Cross Thameslink station because he still has time to catch the number 30 bus as his part in the mock terror exercise. When the tube trains they were supposed to catch are blown up, the other three smell a rat and realize they have been duped and are Muslim patsies who will be blamed for the attacks and everyone knows what happened to Lee Harvey Oswald. The Muslims are not from London. Their homes are many miles away and so they are like fish out of water and have no idea what to do or where to go and hide. They realize that they can't go home and do not know anyone in London whom they can trust. The phones are all not working, first of all because they were jammed and then shut down by the authorities so they cannot phone anyone to tell them what has happened. What can they do to prevent themselves from being wrongly blamed for the explosions? What would you do in that situation? On one of the early TV news broadcasts that day, a newsreader announced that a report has come in that three of the terrorists involved in the bombings had been shot and killed by the anti-terrorist branch of the police at Canary Wharf in the Docklands area of London's East End. The announcement was made only once and never repeated for obvious reasons. How could suicide bombers possibly have survived the tube train bombings and then being in the Docklands to be shot. In a New Zealand Herald newspaper article it says that two people were shot dead outside the HSBC building and in Canada's Globe and Mail newspaper only one. There is another newspaper report that the police shot a suicide bomber outside the Credit Suisse First Boston Bank which is approximately 1,400 feet or 467 yards away from the HSBC building. Measured door to door. The two buildings are very different in both shape and size and 467 yards apart and thus they are not easily confused with each other. 
Police were yesterday probing reports a man had been neutralised outside Canary Wharf. It is believed the man was shot dead by police marksmen outside the Credit Suisse First Boston Bank, South London Press. That means that the police shot and killed at least three suicide bombers in Canary Wharf on 7-7-2005. How could suicide bombers, who were supposed to have blown themselves up on the three tube trains, have survived and been shot dead at Canary Wharf? If we have at least three of the four suicide bombers shot dead at Canary Wharf, and we know they weren't on the tube trains that blew up because the 0740 AM train from Luton to King's Cross was cancelled that day, then we have overwhelming proof that they did not blow the tube trains up and that the blowing up of the three tube trains was an inside job. At the Canary Wharf Docklands site there are media companies for the Muslim patsies to have told their story to and cleared their names if they could and two possible escape routes via air from the nearby London City Airport that has flights to 34 destinations in the UK and Europe and if they couldn't fly out there was the possibility of getting a boat across the channel to France. Sixth chapter title The Number 30 Bus the fourth Muslim backpacker, Hasib Hussain, who has been blamed for the number 30 bus bombing, is reported to have been seen wandering around London, going into McDonald's and eating a beef burger. He is reported to have tried unsuccessfully to contact the other three by phone on Euston Road outside King's Cross at 08.55am, but the phones were not working because they were first of all jammed and then shut down by the authorities. What happened to him? He was the youngest of the four, only 18 years old, and described by those who knew him as a gentle giant. Therefore he was possibly the least worldly wise, and he was also on his own in a strange city and a long way from home. He might not have realised he was in danger of being framed as a patsy, believed all the chaos around that part of London was just part of the mock terrorism exercise that he was part of, and so just continued with his assigned role, which was to board a certain double-decker bus at an appointed time and sit at the back of the top deck. A double-decker upon which a large advertisement for a play had been placed on one side, reading Outright Terror, Bold and Brilliant. Please think about that sign on the side of the bus and the sick minds of the people who planned the attacks. Now this is where it gets weird because we are told that Hasib Hussein started from King's Cross Thameslink Station and was seen on a number 91 bus travelling west along Euston Road to Euston Station, where he caught the number 30 bus that would have then travelled east back along Euston Road, retracing his steps back to where he started from at King's Cross, if it had not been diverted into Tavistock Square. Why would someone carrying a large heavy backpack do that? unless he was following a script written by someone who knew in advance that that particular number 30 bus registration LX03BUF would be diverted into Tavistock Square and that Hasib Hussein would therefore not be able to get on it at King's Cross Thameslink which is where he had arrived at on the train from Luton. Only someone who is a stranger to London would do that without asking why, because it is a totally illogical thing to do for someone who knows London and knows that the number 30 bus 
goes past King's Cross Thameslink station so that they could have caught it there instead. It would have been a complete waste of time, energy, money and an unnecessary risk to take and thus a totally illogical thing for a real terrorist to do. It now gets unbelievably weird because the number 91 bus that Hasib Hussain is reported to have taken from King's Cross along Euston Road to Euston Station to board the number 30 bus registration LX03BUF that got diverted into Tavistock Square actually goes to Tavistock Square so if he wanted to get to Tavistock Square he could just have stayed on the number 91 bus and been sure of getting directly to Tavistock Square the number 91 bus route goes from King's Cross to Tavistock Square that is conclusive proof that that particular number 30 bus registration LX03BUF was part of Peter Power and his customers mock terrorist drill pre-rigged with explosives like the three tube trains and was pre-planned to be diverted into and blown up in Tavistock Square rather than blown up by a backpack bomb whoever planned this obviously planned to kill Hasib Hussain with that bus explosion so he could not tell anyone what had happened just as they had planned to kill the other three Muslim actors with the explosions on the three tube trains at 0900 a.m. a number 30 bus registration LX03 BUF left Marble Arch on its return journey to Hackney Wick it arrived at Euston bus station at 0935 a.m. and was then diverted from its normal route into Tavistock Square and stopped outside the medical offices of the BMA where it was blown up at 09.47 a.m. as part of the terrorist exercise gone live. This also fits with the BBC Panorama Mock Terrorist Programme of May 2004 where the explosion of a road vehicle was scheduled to take place after the three tube train explosions. A white van from a demolition company called Kingstar is seen and photographed parked at the side of the bus immediately after the explosion and a mysterious witness, Richard Jones, gives an account of what he says happened to the bus on camera which is something that normally would not be allowed by the police unless it was part of a film training exercise. Then. After a spate of very contradictory TV and newspaper interviews within a very short space of time that makes sure everyone now believes the explosion was caused by a suicide bomber on the bus, Richard Jones disappears from view. However, and of particular interest, some newspapers, including the UK Sunday Mail on the 10th of July 2005, reported that Richard Jones served an apprenticeship at an explosives factory in Ayrshire. Richard Jones' statements about the suicide bomber are very suspicious for two reasons. First, because they are so inconsistent and contradictory that they are not believable. And second, because criminals usually accuse someone else to divert attention away from themselves. Is that what Richard Jones did? He says that he and 11 other people got off the bus just before it exploded. Were the 12 of them a team with the other 11 there to cover up what Richard Jones was doing as he planted a bomb? Another strange statement he made to the Sun newspaper reported in the 8th of July 2005 edition is that he got off the bus because he had reached his destination. How could he possibly have reached his destination on a bus that had been diverted from its normal route 
unless he was part of the mock terrorism exercise team and got off the bus as planned in Tavistock Square after planting a bomb just before it was detonated. Does he work for Kingstar? Kingstar, whose white van was parked next to the bus, is a company that specialises in controlled demolitions and Richard Jones said he served an apprenticeship at an explosives factory in Ayrshire. Was the Kingstar van there as part of Peter Power and his customers training mock terrorism drill to supervise the mock explosion that became real? So, if Hasib Hussain was supposed to have been on that number 30 bus, registration LX03BUF, how would it be possible for him to get the exact bus that would get him to one of the four locations when that bus was diverted from its normal route to Tavistock Square, when that bus was diverted from its normal route to Tavistock Square, unless he had been recruited to play the part of a mock terrorist and told exactly which bus to get, where and at what time by the people who organised the mock terrorism exercise and who knew the bus would be diverted to Tavistock Square. The odds against that happening by coincidence are unbelievable and thus it is not possible that it was a coincidence. Another unbelievable coincidence is that all of the CCTV cameras at all four of the blast sites were not working that day. The four CCTV cameras on the number 30 bus were just like the Israeli variant systems ones on the underground, not working, and there are no reliable witnesses who can place Hasib Hussain on the number 30 bus. Richard Jones is an unreliable witness whose physical descriptions of the man he says was the suicide bomber does not fit with Hasib Hussain's appearance or what he was wearing that day. So there is no proof that Hasib Hussain was either on that bus or blew it up. Even so, he has been tried and wrongfully found guilty of blowing up the number 30 bus by the government organised and controlled media machine without a shred of real evidence. They claim to have found Hasib Hussain's ID in Tavistock Square. However, they also claim that ID from another of the four, Muhammad Siddiqui Khan, was found in at least two, some reports say three, separate blast locations. He cannot possibly have been in two or all three locations at the same time, proving that these items were planted after the blasts. How could their IDs have survived suicide bomb blasts? Millions of people are aware of the magic fireproof Mohammed Atta passport that was planted at the World Trade Center on 9-11. In light of these incidents, if ID from Hasib Hussein was found at Tavistock Square, it does not necessarily mean that he was on the bus and not somewhere else. Or, if he was on the bus, that he blew the bus up. What has happened to the presumption of innocence and being considered innocent until proven guilty and convicted by a jury of your peers in court that has always been the mainstay of British justice? The most likely case is that the number 30 bus had been pre-rigged with explosives during its previous service when the CCTV cameras were disabled. The CCTV systems on stagecoach buses are normally either the Israeli company variant systems RP12001 or Timespace X200. A witness, Richmal Marie Oates Whitehead, aged 35, who worked at the BMA in Tavistock Square and was hailed as a heroine for her actions during the London bombings, said she heard two explosions on the bus. 
the controlled media immediately went on the offensive and did a character assassination of the heroine because her testimony did not fit with the official story and she died unexpectedly shortly afterwards. However, other witnesses also reported a second explosion on the bus. Richmal's and other witnesses' testimonies would account for pre-planted explosives and a bomb being planted later on 7-7-2005. What we can be certain about though is that either on the bus or elsewhere Hasib Hussain, like the other three Muslim patsies, was murdered. Seventh chapter title, Pre-Planted Explosives Witnesses of the tube train explosions state that there were no Muslims with backpacks and no backpacks or bags left unattended on the trains in the carriages that blew up and the floors of the trains blew upwards from underneath, not downwards as would be the case with explosives inside the trains. Explosives under the train floors, powerful enough to rupture the carriage floors and bend them upwards, would also lift the carriages up off the rails and derail them, as did happen. Those explosives were not homemade, but military grade high explosives that would not be available to Muslim suicide bombers. The official story was that they used homemade explosives which has later been proven to be a lie. So we know from reliable eyewitnesses who can be traced that there were no backpack homemade bombs or Muslim bombers inside the tube train carriages that blew up and that the floors blew upwards so the bombs which were made from military grade explosives must have been fastened underneath the floors of the train carriages. Only people having access to the tube trains during the times that the trains were not running would be able to plant those bombs under the train floors. Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli finance minister, said that he was warned by Scotland Yard not to leave his hotel room on the morning of 7-7-2005 before the first explosion was reported implying that they had foreknowledge of the plan. Scotland Yard then quickly denied being the ones who had provided the warning, but have not told us who did warn Netanyahu if they did not. Why was Benjamin Netanyahu warned, but not the British people who pay their wages and whom they are paid to protect? Was it because it would have spoiled their evil plan to murder British people to change the nation's mind about British troops fighting in the Middle East. Two weeks later, the head of the Israeli Mossad, General Meir Dagan, said that he had warned Benjamin Netanyahu at 08.40 a.m. on 7-7-2005, ten minutes before the first blast occurred. How did he know what was going to happen in London if Scotland Yard did not warn him? Did he wait to warn Benjamin Netanyahu until it was too late to warn the British people so as not to spoil their evil plan? Was the London bombing a covert MI5 operation or an Israeli Mossad operation or a joint operation by both of them? The British people have the right to know. Tony Blair said on the day of the explosions that we know this was done in the name of Islam when there was no proof whatsoever of who had done it therefore indicating he possibly had foreknowledge of the plan and who they intended to blame and the reason why they were going to blame the Muslims. As proof that this was a slip-up and needed covering up Look at how the BBC later falsely reported his actual words, giving further proof that the BBC is a government propaganda machine and the coverage was organised 
exactly as Michael Portillo said it would be in the BBC Panorama programme in May 2004. Later that same day, Ephraim Halevi, a former head of the Israeli Mossad, wrote in an article published on the Jerusalem Post website at 18.10pm London time that the attacks had been carried out simultaneously with near-perfect execution. How did he know they had only been near-perfect? How could he have known what the perfect results should have been in order to know that the actual results were not perfect unless he was in on the plot? How many more people had they intended to murder in order for it to be considered perfect execution? How did he know, at least two days before the London authorities released the information on the 9th of July, that the bombs were detonated simultaneously, unless he was in on the plot? As proof that this too was a slip-up, the Jerusalem Post article in question was completely removed from their website after people began to ask similar questions. The following day, Police Commissioner Ian Blair also made a slip-up on camera and said that there were four miserable bombers and then very quickly corrected himself, showing that he too possibly had foreknowledge of the plan to use four Muslims as patsies. If London could survive the Blitz, it can survive four miserable bombers like this. I'm not saying there are four bombers, four miserable events like this. We are told that the first reports were of an electrical power surge that occurred. And then later we were told that there were bombs that exploded on the tube trains and that it was an Al-Qaeda terrorist attack. With Muslim suicide bombers carrying backpack homemade explosive devices onto the tube trains. A couple of weeks later a Brazilian contract electrician is brutally and publicly murdered on a tube train and again we are told lies by the police and media about him. He was a contract electrician. For whom had he been working and what had he been working on in the days leading up to the 7th of July 2005? Remember that the first reports from the media about 7-7-2005 were of an electrical power surge and John Charles de Menezes was a contract electrician. Was he hired as part of the terrorist exercises 1,000 people to wire up devices for mock explosions to be set off by a power surge? Did he see the explosive devices being fastened under the tube train carriage floors and later realise what had really happened and was starting to talk about it? Did they, the hierarchy enslaving him, publicly execute him to shut him up and as a warning to others to keep their mouths shut? We have been unable to find out where he worked. We know about his cousins who live in London and his family coming over from Brazil, but we do not know where he worked. Why? Who is the person calling himself Richard Jones and claiming to have been next to the suicide bomber on the bus and a witness to the bus bombing? And why did he tell so many lies? Why did Peter Power smirk, grin and giggle when he spoke about the coincidence that the exercise had turned out to be real when lots of people had been killed and injured. What is funny about that? The probability of the 7-7-2005 drill and attack coinciding without being planned to coincide in a 10 year period is one chance in 3 Seven one five five nine two six one three two six five 
seven five zero 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 I wonder why the media aren't investigating the drill. Why are Peter Power, Verint Systems, Richard Jones, Commissioner Ian Blair, the anti-terrorist branch who shot and murdered these innocent people, the Israeli Mossad, Tony Blair and the government itself not under investigation for these horrendous crimes? Eighth chapter title. Conclusion. The times of the trains and tube trains on that day have been carefully checked. The first train after 07.40 a.m. left Luton at 07.56 a.m. and arrived at King's Cross Thameslink Station at 08.42 a.m. The three tube trains that blew up left King's Cross Underground Station at 08.35 a.m the eastbound circle line train number 204 08.42 a.m. the westbound circle line train number 216 08.48 a.m. the Piccadilly line train south it was therefore impossible for any of the four accused Muslims to have caught the tube trains that blew up if we have at least three of the four suicide bombers being shot dead at Canary Wharf and we know they weren't on the tube trains because the 07.40 a.m. train from Luton to King's Cross was cancelled that day and the photo of them outside Luton station at 07.21.54 a.m. is a fake and that Hasib Hussain was part of the mock terrorism exercise then we have overwhelming proof that the four accused Muslims were patsies and are innocent and that it was an inside job and that, like Lee Harvey Oswald, they too have been murdered to silence them. Whether the bombings were done by MI5, the Israeli Mossad or both of them and or others has yet to be determined. But the one thing that we can be sure of is that it was not done by four young Muslims. Ninth chapter title, Epilogue. Hopefully, among the security services, there must be at least some decent, honest people who know that the official story is a pack of lies and are troubled by it. Unfortunately, they are all keeping quiet about it. We need them to have the courage to come forward and say what they know and arrest their evil colleagues and bring them to justice if they don't want to be also condemned as accomplices of the government and media criminals who committed treason and mass murder that day and helped to cover it up, enabling the Orwellian Big Brother police state plans for Britain to pick up steam. And the real perpetrators the New World Order government terrorists, to plunge the world into World War III and Armageddon. Why do you think they have made a Big Brother TV program to program people's minds and get them used to the idea of living under constant surveillance and to like it and volunteer to take part in it? Why do you think they are called programs? It is because they are used for mind control, brainwashing, programming of the public's minds into obeying and sleepwalking whilst following their New World Order hidden agenda. The sleeper must awaken. The sleeper must awaken. The television is the greatest mind control and propaganda weapon ever invented. Do you think you should be paying for a TV license to fund all their programming of your mind and the lies and propaganda they are broadcasting 
to deceive, brainwash, control and enslave everyone, including you? Does the TV and watching it not already control most of your life and the way you think? Do you think you should be paying for all those CCTV cameras and their operatives to spy on you everywhere you go so they can enslave you and fine you, thereby stealing your money for doing nothing wrong? Especially when they use your own money from those fines and taxes to pay for even more CCTV cameras so you have even less privacy and freedom and then they claim that the cameras do not work when there is a real crime being committed by the people who control the cameras? Don't you realize that in paying fines and taxes you are actually paying for the chains they are using to enslave you with? Wake up, look and see the reality that you are actually paying for them to turn you into their slave. The government is continually and illegally passing new legislation to restrict your freedom and obtain more and more information about you to control you, and yet they themselves are becoming more and more secretive and out of control. They have turned the relationship between the people and government into the opposite of what it should be. It should be public servants serving the people not the people serving public government masters or, more accurately, dictators. Please, for your own sakes, make copies of this film for everyone you know and for the media outlets in your area, to wake them up and let everyone know the truth so that the public will give the decent, honest people in the security services their support and encouragement to tell the truth and arrest their evil colleagues. Long live the fighters. Mwadib.